morning and welcome to I-24 News Defense Magazine. I'm Alon Ben David and I will be bringing you a weekly review of security, intelligence and strategic affairs with a broader perspective of global defense news. In this edition, as Israel's northern front heats up, we have an exclusive interview with Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon, who refers for the first time to the killing of Iranian and Hezbollah operatives in Syria. And we ask whether Europe is up to the task of protecting its citizens from growing terror threats. Let's begin. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon, former IDF Chief of Staff, decorated soldier and outspoken politician, has been in office for two years in the midst of an eventful week after a Hezbollah convoy was hit in Syria, placing Israel's borders with Syria and Lebanon on high alert and the International Criminal Court decision to investigate possible war crimes committed by the IDF against Palestinians, we met Yalon at his office in Tel Aviv. Minister Yalon, I want to first thank you very much for taking the time and joining us in our renewed defense magazine at I-24. Thank you for having me. Hezbollah has vowed to avenge the death of his uh, people uh, in the Golan Heights this week and have blamed Israel for uh, striking a convoy of Hezbollah. Is there a reason for concern in your uh, eyes? Israel is always blamed. We are used to be blamed for any activities in the region, and this is the case. Of course, because of the threats on behalf of Hezbollah, we should be ready. Do you, do you fear that their response could escalate the region to a war? Uh, we are not fearing, but uh, nevertheless, we should be ready for any act, for any uh, action and even to any escalation. They've announced the names of the people that died there. One of them is Jihad Mouni. You're probably familiar with him. Could you tell us anything about that character? Uh, not, not now. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, without any uh, uh, Israeli involvement or whatever, uh, bad guys, all of them. So despite the fact that they are heavily involved in the civil war in Syria, they still have the confidence to renew friction with Israel. They are placing uh, IEDs in uh, Hardov. They are placing mines along the Syrian border. They are firing rockets. Are they not? They are not afraid to clash with Israel again. I believe that Hezbollah, generally speaking, is deterred from being involved in any kind of uh, escalation with us. Uh, Hezbollah is still uh, able. Uh, to uh, detonate explosives in the uh, Dove Mountain, as it happened uh, twice in the last uh, couple of months, or to launch rockets from here and there, not from Lebanese soil so far, but from Syrian soil, as it happened in the past. Looking at the south, there are growing signs of distress coming out of Hamas, hoping that they would breach what they call the siege of Gaza, but they haven't. Do you see a chance that we might go into another conflict with them? Hamas uh, suffers from a blow, talking about protective oper edge operation last summer. Uh, looking towards the Gaza Strip of today, actually they didn't uh, achieve anything uh, as they tried to achieve by provoking uh, the rocket attack and the escalation last summer. And of course they are looking now for um, reconstructing the Gaza Strip. Uh, so far, what we try to do, even from the Ministerium point of view, we try to allow the reconstruction materials to be delivered to the Gaza Strip. Uh, we wanted the Palestinian Authority to be involved in it, even to gain political power as a result of it. But they deny accountability anyhow, not just on this issue. So our assessment is that Hamas is committed to uh, seize the fire and it is deterred and his vital interest is, first of all, to reconstruct uh, Gaza for the benefit of the people. But um, isn't it an Israeli uh, interest to allow Hamas to breathe more freely if, we're going in, if the economic distress in the Gaza Strip will become harsher, they might be pushed again to fight? If Hamas decides to uh, produce and export strawberries, no uh, security restrictions will be imposed by Israel around the Gaza Strip. But as long as they are uh, looking and they are anxious to, 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 to produce, to manufacture and export rockets, 
then we should be very cautious. The ICC announced the uh, beginning of examination of Israel conduct in the, in the territories. Is this, you think, the first step toward uh, placing a jurisdiction of the ICC on, uh, on the West Bank and Gaza? You know, it's another hypocritic step against the state of Israel. You know, Palestinian Authority, uh, which used to uh, perpetrate and execute homicide bombing attacks, and now associate with Hamas, which is used to launch rockets against our civilians, using their own civilians as human shield, and we are to be blamed. We are to be brought to the ICC. It's not just between us and Palestinian Authority and Hamas. It's between the Western world and ISIS and Al-Qaeda, global jihad elements, whatever, which now attack uh, civilians in Europe, used to attack uh, civilians in the United States, and, of course, uh, perpetrating uh, terror attacks all over the Middle East. It is, again, the Western vital interest, as we understand it. So we hope that the Western world will wake up and operate against this hypocritic uh, institute, which is called the ICC, uh, in a situation in which, in the past, they had to deal with criminals, war criminals. We are not war criminals. We don't have war criminals in the, in the IDF, in the Israel Defense Forces. But beyond hope, what are you practically doing to block this initiative? Uh, first of all, we uh, uh, are going to, to deal with it diplomatically, uh, trying to mobilize more Western parties uh, to, to deal with it in the right manner, uh, and, of course, uh, to protect ourselves, to protect our soldiers. We are not going to sacrifice our soldiers or officers to, in front of the ICC in any way. We are not going to cooperate with it. So uh, we'll find a way to defend ourselves by uh, ourselves, as we are used to do during uh, all the years. Does it place any limitations on your personal travel around the world? It might be. You know, in the past I was blamed, again, with uh, hypocritic uh, uh, allegations, which I hate to deal personally. And as uh, you know, I, I said and I say to, to our soldiers and officers, when you are uh, drafted to the military, you should be ready to sacrifice your lives to save the state of Israel. So it's part, part of the sacrifice. One last issue. Um, your predecessor, Ehud Barak, was quoted in recent weeks as saying that the windows of, window of opportunities to strike Iran is shutting down. Are we losing, are, is Israel losing the ability to launch a, an effective strike against Iran? No doubt that the Iranian regime is the main generator and instigator for instability in the Middle East. You can find Iranian fingerprints everywhere, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen now, in Syria, in Lebanon, in the Palestinian arena, and even beyond the Middle East. By one way or another, the military and nuclear project in Iran should be stopped. Clear policy. It's not going to be achieved by uh, concessions. Uh, and when we talk now about what's going on on the uh, diplomatic track, P5 plus 1 uh, engage with the Iranian regime, uh, the framework is, is, is quite, uh, uh, I would say, uh, frustrating. That's why we claim that, first of all, no deal is better than a bad deal. But Israel, anyhow, should be ready to defend itself by itself. And there is no closed window, window as, as, as we see it. We should be ready to defend ourselves by ourselves. So military options still on the table? Sure. Thank you very much for the interview, Minister Yalom. Thank you. Military options still on the table, says Yalom. We're moving on. The Paris terror attacks are still echoing throughout Europe. Following a series of anti-terror arrests in France, Belgium, Greece, and Ireland, EU foreign ministers met to discuss a united response to the growing threat of radical Islam. I-24 correspondent Eli Hochenberg has more. What was defined as the European 9-11 is triggering a similar reaction from European nations as the original did in the United States, a plan aimed at stopping the spread of terrorism. 
EU foreign ministers met Monday in Brussels to discuss exactly that. After the deadly Paris attacks and anti-terrorism raids in Belgium, the ministers are promoting the idea of building an alliance, including with Muslim countries, against the growing militant extremist threat. I am pleased that the interior minister came together very quickly after the attacks to discuss political commitments and responsibilities to be learned from this experience. The immediate focus for the 28th nation European Union is how to prevent citizens known as foreign fighters returning home from the battlefields in Syria and Iraq even more radicalized and well trained. A crucial problem is that the EU's free movement zone makes it extremely difficult to security forces to monitor jihadists, travel surveillance or new databases to monitor all air travel in, out and within Europe is one of the possible solutions. Of course we will, we will all be determined to do what is necessary to keep Europe safe and we'll be looking at some of the specific measures that will help to keep us safe, like passenger name records within Europe, so that's important. But, we'll but there's one main emphasis of the European officials, anti-terror measures should be in cooperation with Arab countries. Uh, I'm just having now, uh, before we start a meeting with the Secretary General of the Arab League, as the threat uh, is not only the one we faced in uh, Paris, but also spreading in many other parts of the world, starting from Muslim countries. Police forces in France, Belgium and Germany have been conducting dozens of arrests in effort to eliminate jihadist cells. Furthermore, a planned anti-Islamic rally in the eastern German city of Dresden was cancelled due to, quote, concrete threat of a terror attack against the organizers and participants. Joining me now is David Arel, Israel's CEO of uh, security and risk management consulting firm Acero and the former head of uh, international relations for Shin Bet, Israel's uh, security agency. Thanks for joining us. You are very familiar with the European agencies of uh, security and intelligence. Would the Paris events be a wake-up call for them? Uh, I would say so, most definitely. Um, the impact has been uh, significant. Um, Despite the fact there have been several attacks previous to the attacks in Paris, in Brussels, in, in Brussels at the uh, at the museum, in Paris at the school in Toulouse, uh, this one the impact was greater. The fact it was on a newspaper, the fact that it was a failure not just of uh, intelligence but also a failure of uh, protective security. Because so, Charlie Hebdo office were protected. That's right. Uh, they, they, it was clearly mentioned that there was a high threat to, to the uh, to both the building and to the uh, participants. The uh, some of the editors had uh, bodyguards. There was police out. Outside. And despite this, uh, two terrorists, well-armed terrorists, trained terrorists, were able to come, overcome the security, both the uh, police and the physical security in place, and carry out their, unfortunately, carry out their, the objective they, they sought. Those two terrorists were known jihadists. Can the European agencies put all those jihadists, estimated at least 1,000 in every country, under complete coverage? Oh, there's been a thousand from France, a thousand from England who have gone overseas. Country, yeah. No, have gone from each country that have gone overseas to fight in Iraq and Syria. Mm -hmm. For everyone that goes overseas, there's probably another ten or even more that identify with the same ideology and could be just as dangerous. Like Koulibaly. Exactly. C they, do they have the capabilities, the European agencies, to cover those people, to f fully cover them in the intelligence? Clearly they're very stretched. You can, uh, every month goes by where you'll hear the head of an intelligence agency saying that they're having trouble monitoring all those who are returning. Uh, they're sending, uh, they're putting out warnings that it is difficult to monitor such a huge influx of jihadist terrorists into the country. So they're going to have problems with their resource allocation, and they're going to have to beef up the way they do things. But from your friction with your European colleagues, do they have the mindset already changed after this event, or do they still need to change it? Well, I'm not still in contact with my, with my colleagues from the past, but um, definitely they have the will to do it. Um, this is not the, the, these are not the first terrorist attacks they've had experience with, and the, they certainly seem to have put their mind to it. They will be able to deal with it. And the massive crackdown that we see all across the continent now on, on those terror cells, would that not generate another uh, uh, wave of terror as those cells knowing that if they won't act now, they might be caught? 
That's a very good question. It's like the chicken and the egg. Uh, in the, in one hand, you cannot ignore what's going on because you're going to get another terror attack. And some people will say that terrorists' intention is to cause a crackdown, and that crackdown will lead to uh, uh, more people being attracted to the ideology. So on one hand, you have to uh, use the, the carrot, and the other hand, the stick. So you have to crack down, but the, you also have to look at ways to, to, to defuse the tensions that are causing this kind of radicalization. Legally, do Europe have the, the means, the tools, in order to deal with terrorism like that? N uh, not completely. They are already discussing ways of changing um, um, legislation regarding the, the Internet and monitoring the Internet uh, to prevent... Um, prevent uh, jihadists having access to uh, uh, encryptology, um, to be able to store data, uh, large data, and be able to mine it in, in the right way. Definitely, there are going to be, there's a need now to change uh, some of the laws in order to be more effective, especially in the area of the Internet. David Orell, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you. That's all we have uh, for now. For all the latest, keep following I-24 News and log on to i24news.tv. Join us again next week for another Defense Magazine. Have a safe night from Jaffa Port. Good night.